and I should be all set now. <laughs> and now I will, I am pleased to introduce Ursula Brinkman. Ursula is a psychologist by training and she is a very accomplished professional in the area of intercultural work. She's the co-founder and director of Intercultural Business Improvement. She has developed the International Readiness Check Assessment and published a book called International Intercultural Readiness. And she told me earlier she is joining us in the middle of what she calls a small project of moving house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And well, with that, I will hand it over to you, Ursula. Looking yes. very much forward to this session. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, and also, and Christine, for setting this up and for helping me getting into all of this. And hello to all of you out there, uh, Berlin, Finland, also the Netherlands. Um, and I see some names I, rec uh, I recognize, but also many new ones, which is great. Um, I'm very, you know, it's, it's exciting to have a webinar with CETA Europa and with so many people. And please, if you have comments in between or if I go too fast, um, try and stop me through Steve. I have a couple of moments when I ask you about your experiences. So then we will have some form of interaction, even though I don't see you. Um, and um, yeah, I hope we have an ex enjoyable learning session. Um, let's start with a picture of one of my favorite people just now. Let me just see how fast the next slide comes up. Ah, this is a little zoom thing. Yes. You probably all recognize her, Greta Thunberg. What's different about her? Can you type in some words what makes her different from everybody else? Motivated, yes. Definitely courage, absolutely. Outspoken, focus. Determined, oh yes. And yes, autistic, ambitious, gay, strong, centered, yes. In indeed, I just recently learned, I mean, everyone knows she's by now 16, she's female, she's brave, she's clear, she's fearless, um, and just Less than a year ago, she was sitting next to the Swedish parliament with, with a board card, a uh, piece of carton, a board card and saying kind of like, I'm on strike. If you can't help, uh, can't save the climate, I'm going to go on strike. Why, why go to school if you can't save the climate? Um, and that, as you know, has just turned into a wildfire, one of the most hopeful, hope-giving wildfires we ever know. And I just um, re learned that she has Asperger's syndrome. So she is not interested in pleasing people. She's not interested in subtlety, in gray zones, in yes, but well, maybe you must see the pluses and the minuses and how difficult it is. No, she just says, this is black and white. We either get our act together or we don't. And, she, and she, she links this to Asperger's syndrome. And I think this is just a wonderful example of how one tiny person who happens also to be female um, and completely off, you know, younger than most leaders in the world, uh, creates a worldwide movement uh, that gives us hope that something might happen. And that is indeed the story of today, of this webinar, the, the, the diversity, what makes us different um, what, how that helps, what's the promise in the diversity that we bring to it all. The webinar we call Team Readiness. This is the name of the approach that we promote, that we have developed. Um, and we'll share with you some of the key insights that underlie the approach. Hopefully you will get away with some nice examples that you can use uh, uh, with your work. Um, and um, it's about diversity in teams and the teams can benefit from the diversity. That's the main story here, uh, but they must have the capacity to do so. It just doesn't come just because you're diverse. Uh, it's, it, it requires a really well-developed muscle and we call this, you might say, team readiness. And it's an approach we've designed to help teams develop this capacity to benefit from their diversity. Um, the webinar has a couple of parts. Let's first look at the bright side, the promise of culturally diverse teams, 
then at some roadblocks, some obstacles, but also some factors that research has shown helps these teams to get along, to benefit from their diversity. So which factors must be in place? And then we're going to link this to the competencies, intercultural competencies that must be present in a team, or if they are present in a team, then this team will find it easy, easier, more easily to overcome the obstacles. So we're going to look at, uh, take a look at those competencies and uh, a glimpse of the process that we've developed for, um, you know, for a workshop type approach. Um, and we're going to have a check out your main takeaways from this session. I wish I could talk to you more easily. We will have some interactive moments. Um, hopefully, um, while I'm speaking, you're not switching off and getting bored. Um, here is a tough question for you all, namely, what do these events, both from politics and the corporate world, have in common? First, the invasion of Pigs Bay, the decision of the Kennedy team to invade Cuba, the Pigs Bay, in April 61, which turned out to be a major disaster. Then Pearl Harbor, no need to explain more about that, the invasion or the bombarding of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese uh, in December 41, surprise, US select elections in 2016. And from the corporate world, this is not just about US, this is also the bankruptcy of the Swiss airline, Swiss Air, which seemed to so safe that it was also called the flying bank, but still it went bankrupt in 2002. And then a slashing of shareholder value of two major British companies, British Airways and Marks and Spencer's in 1998 and 1999. Do you know, and here's a question to you all, do you know what these five events share, what they have in common? Technical analysis behind that. Feel free to type. Major change, yes. What else? It's a tough question. Yes, leadership, the type of leadership. Yes, inability to communicate across difference, surprise, shock, exactly. A certain cultural logic, yes, exactly. No diversity, exactly. We are getting there, exactly. This is indeed the absence of the requisite diversity. And it's called groupthink, and I'm sure you've come across that. Um, the term was coined by Irving Janis in these years, his um, publications. Um, and he said, he called this a mode of thinking that we start to engage in when we're deeply involved in a completely cohesive in-group where our desire to fit in um, overrides our motivation to be realistic and to realistically look at the alternatives. For example, the group that decided to invade the Pigs Bay, um, they had one psychologist from San Francisco who said, listen guys, this is silly, don't do this, this is, th th don't do it. He was kicked out of the team. Um, then there, it was a whole team of white Protestant elite people who reaffirmed towards each other that their way of thinking was the right one. And as a group, they, importantly, as a group, they decided to invade the Pigs Bay. Later on, they analyzed their individual diary notes, they analyzed individual conversations these people had. So all the individual separate lines of thoughts that were available to analysis. And it turned out that not a single member of that team was in favor of the invasion. But as a group, they took the decision to invade, which was the wrong decision. So this is the, the most um, striking version of groupthink, where a group can take a decision that as an individual, nobody of the group would take. And this is the opposite of diversity in the team. When we have complete homogeneity in a team that leads to group insulation and keeps the, uh, really kind of leads to majorly uh, wrong decisions. So if you need some examples for your clients to convince them to invest in diversity, please feel free to take them, these ones. 
And of course, the power of diversity. And I'm sure you've come across this in many, many ways. Everyone is talking about the beauty of diversity. I selected some examples um, that you might you know, like to have. This is uh, from um, an example from medicine uh, and from biology, where for many, many years, uh, what you see on the right-hand side, this is the rough system of how our kidneys work. And what you see are uh, tub tubules, I hope I, tubules, I hope I pronounced it somewhere correctly. Steve, how do I pronounce this? Tubules? That's a good question, Osla. I'm not sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's these little How about tubes. Tubes, tubes yes. yes. Tubes, tubes, exactly. So for many, many years, no one knew what these tubes, these curved parts here in the, in the display, in the, in the kidneys, what they were made for. And they simply thought it were useless leftovers from our evolution. And we wouldn't need to take care of them and study them. But then an engineer came in and looked at the loops and he saw that these were counter current multipliers. So it's a certain thing from engineering, uh, Gegenstrom, you would say in, in German, as my nephew told me. Um, so mechanisms that ensure that liquids are concentrated in the system. So they do have a function and an engineer was necessary to discover the function and they do turn out to be vital parts of our kidneys operations. There are many more examples like this. This is from Edward de Bono's lateral thinking. Another one is for how helping the homeless was solved. Um, there was, a, again, a psychologist, it just happens to be a psychologist again, Sam, Sam Burris, who was trained in treating mental uh, illnesses, but he had no experience in treating homelessness. He took a job where he was basically required to find a solution to homelessness and he assembled a team of people which also had no experience with that at all. A recovering heroin addict, a formerly homeless person, another psychologist and a poet who also was a survivor of incest. This um, mixed team, uh, this bunch of people, they sat together, they discussed and they said, well, let's solve the problem by giving them permanent housing. And this turned out to be very, very powerful. It took away all the structural problems that homeless people have. And the uh, state of Utah elimin eliminated homelessness and all the problems associated with it. And Phoenix, Phoenix eliminated the chronic homelessness of uh, veterans that veterans often have. So another example of how diversity in a team um, or diversity amongst people can solve a problem that for many, many uh, years was people weren't able to solve. Lo and behold, this is why now everyone is singing the praise um, of diversity. You know, if you go through Harvard Business Reviews, Forbes, Boston Consulting Groups, everyone just says, oh, diversity is great. Um, and then you have these wonderful pictures. Um, and I looked at the, ten, the websites of the 10 of the most major European companies recently, and you have the names here, Shell, Volkswagen, etc. Virtually on each website, they say diversity is great, great and we support it and we have our DNI officer and we celebrate diversity and it helps us to innovate. So that is the current climate and I hope that we can really kind of like keep that strength and keep that positive attitude. Whereas for many, many years, we as intercultural professionals actually came in saying, oh, diversity, you, you know, if you don't take care of, the, of differences, you will have problems. But now the tune is actually, hey, here is diversity, and these differences are actually great. So that's the current diversity in teams idea. We're going to have two slides showing why diversity, how diversity can have all these wonderful effects. Um, I, Iris Schneider, um, you say, can you explain, please? Um, can you, can you, which question? Can you explain that, please? Iris Schneider? Ah, about the permanent housing. 
Um, well, what they did is they said, well, actually, we can't have, uh, we can have so many support programs, um, uh, re-entry programs, find your way back into work programs. But basically, what these homeless people need is simply a place where they can live permanently without the constant fear of being kicked out again. And so when they then started first at pilot level, I assume, to give permanent, to ensure that homeless people would get these permanent housing places, they realized that all these people were able to get their life back together. That many of the problems that before that seemed to be just tied to these people actually got resolved and they felt certain again, strong enough again, and they could, many of them could get back to work again. So many of the follow-on of the problems associated with homeless people turned out to be actually just linked to being homeless and they got resolved. Okay, similar permanent housing was proposed and offered to people residing in slums in Mumbai. Okay, results after a few years are positive, I hope. Okay, so um, this is, um, I'm not an expert in homelessness. I came across this example, which I liked because it was a great example of how diversity in a team um, can solve a problem that the experts could not resolve. Oh, sold the apartments, oh no, okay, there we go. So we do need to take into account some extra um, sites, namely that they are not supposed to sell the apartments. Thanks, Mitun, for, for these insights from um, this particular project. But the webinar is not about homelessness. If you want additional examples, um, I, they, they, they are there as well. Let me first now get to your experiences about diversity. What are your, um, the permanent is the first step and then other assistance and must be applied, etc. Yes, very good. But let's go back to diversity in a way from the specifics of homelessness. Um, how does diversity, um, what are your positive experiences with diversity? Why do you, what, what, how does it contribute? Can you type in a couple of things there? watching the chat function. What positive experiences do you have with? Okay, Tanya, opens your mind to different ways of doing things. It is enriching other views, gives me ideas, different perspectives, encourage creativity, holistic explanations of, ah, of volunteering from different national perspectives. That's interesting as well. Expands one's own frame of reference Queer Denken, yes, to think out of the box. Yes, fantastic. All sustainable solutions, very good. If these are all your own experiences, this is fantastic. Write them down, make them concrete examples because everyone loves concrete examples. This is fantastic, fantastic. Um, I'm gonna move on. Proposed bimodal ways of working, okay. Um, Okay, that is an interesting one. Um, here I have a picture, from, and um, this is from a famous movie. Do you recognize the movie from which this picture is? It's from, yes, exactly, 12 Angry Men. And can you imagine why um, I included this in the diversity in teams? Probably simple if you look at Henry Fonda in the middle. What was his role in this 12 Angry Men is this movie about 12 people who are in a jury about to judge, about the, decide about the life of a young man who is accused of having killed uh, someone. And in the beginning it all looks clean, clear. Yeah, the jury is not of, um, of, of, of peers. There are no women, but um, here is a case of diversity that works even if uh, at, this level, at this level, a non-diverse team. What this team member, this movie is about, and I can really, I mean, it's fantastic to see it again. It's, um, yes, all white, all men, but still Henry Fonda in this jury. 
he is the one who says, well, can we really be sure that this boy killed that person? And everyone gets at him and says, why? Why is there any doubt? It's crystal clear and all the evidence points in the direction. And he just says, well, this is just a, such an important decision. Should we not simply take the time to decide? So he starts to challenge what in the beginning looked like the opinion of everyone, like a crystal clear case. And the whole movie is about how he ended up deviating from the majority of thinking, even though he was also male and white. He gets the whole jury to change their opinion. So this is the power, the one power of diversity, where if you have different viewpoints in your team, um, you simply have, usually have better and tougher discussions. It's much more likely that there will be one person, maybe two or three, who say, let's take more time to think this through. Should we invade the pig's bay? Should we convict this person? Is this really, your argument doesn't convince me. I can think of counter arguments. So there is, it's, we're not that year, there in the area of creativity and brand new ideas and out of the box thinking. We are simply in the area of being more critical with existing arguments, with avoiding groupthink. This is the one big, uh, advantage of having diversity in a team, that you have tougher discussions and that the majority in the team, even if you have only a single person deviating from the majority line, then the majority in the team is less inclined to opt for the wrong approach. Very, very important. Uh, another big, big advantage of diversity is, and you may wonder what this foot is doing here with this perm, you know, it's not the opposite of the all black, white male. Um, it's, we have better chances just by accident to find, or because we have different experts, different specialists from whom we get input. Therefore, we have better chances to find a great or the right solution. Remember the engineer who saw that the kidney tubes are actually a counter current. He came from a completely different expertise and he looked at the tubes and he said, hey, this is what's going on here. And there are many examples um, from uh, where a difference in um, diversity and expertise leads to new ideas. Okay, let me see some, some questions here. Um, Chris, uh, Steve, can you collect some of these examples and I'm going to finish this slide and then we're going to have some of those questions coming in. Sure, gladly. Okay. Um, another one is the bigger chance that you identify the needs of new target groups or neglected target groups, you might say. One of my favorite examples is in the 60s uh, when there was a young woman, she was actually um, a journalist and she was at a fashion show in New York, and she overheard um, um, African-American models talking about each other, about how difficult it was to get makeup that would work for their skin, and how they had to mix all sorts of makeup lines, etc., in order to get that tone that would actually work for their skins. And she, she thought, what's going on here? Why don't they have the right makeup? And she, she invested a whole year uh, doing research on this and she was, Flory Roberts was her name, she was the very first person who developed a makeup line specifically made for the skin tones of dark African Americans. And today, I mean, every major um, makeup uh, cosmetics firm has, has deals with this uh, target group. And more possible approaches, and here comes the shoe comes in, um, what, uh, great examples of more possible approaches. Um, this goes back to a mafia wedding in 1974, um, uh, where uh, there was a woman on the um, uh, FBI team. She had just, just joined and she solved the problem of how to get, uh, how to approach the mafia boss and hand him the subpoena. The, the paper that accuses that person um, with a certain misdemeanor, with crimes, etc. 
And the challenge here is that you have to give this document, this subpoena, you have to hand it to the, to the person in person. He has to take it from you. And the mafia people, they knew about this and they were always surrounded by bodyguards who would keep any FBI agent from coming so close that they were actually in a position to give them this document. There was always a meter at least between them. Now here comes the first female agent on the team and she says, well, I have an idea, let me try it. And the, um, the, the daughter of one of the big mafia bosses, she was about to get married. And this woman, she dresses up fantastically, you know, with high heels. She comes in with a extremely uh, um, uh, expensive car, gets out, you know, and pretends she's a wedding guest. Approach, gets so close to the father of the bride <laughs> because he thinks he's, this beautiful woman is going to uh, congratulate him. And she hands him, hands him the subpoena and he is too flabbergasted. He accepts the subpoena and bingo, he gets arrested. So more possible approaches because suddenly you have a diversity in the team that can give you this, this new approach. Okay, um, any less time for comments. Steve, did you get some of them that we should have a look at and would like to have a look at? Yes, there are several questions for you, Ursula. Okay. So Nancy asks, how does this work in culturally diverse teams ah. where, where some cultures find intense and long discussions as unnecessary or too long? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, probably um, you don't even need much cultural diversity or cultural diversity to find this challenging. And this really hits at one of the key challenges of, of having a diverse team. It's great to know that in all our different viewpoints makes better arguments and better decisions, but it's exhausting. It can be extremely exhausting. And so you certainly as the team leader, you must be crystal clear in your mind as to why this is, why you are motivated to do this. Because you will also need to motivate everybody you will need to find a way to not, of course, there can always be at some point a discussion that just is dead, you know, nothing new comes in anymore. But you will need to find space um, and breathing space, intellectual space, to allow these different opinions to come in. Uh, you will, in any case, need certain facilitation techniques, uh, different ways of getting everybody's input, not just say, okay, any ideas out there and shout and then hope that everybody will say something because only few people will say something and many others will be silent. You will have to need different ways of getting people to say something. For example, around Robin, have everyone, one after the other, contribute. Or you will have to invite them to go out into subgroups, come back with the best challenging counter-argument. Mm. So those are some easy, accessible, plausible approaches. Later down in the webinar, we're gonna come back to this extra skill, which is less visible as to how you can get the perspectives. Um, but you definitely also need to manage the energy in a team. And that's also what you were pointing at, Nancy. Yes. Okay. Hope I answered your question. Many more questions, Steve. Claudia asks, how do you avoid or overcome the risk of analysis paralysis? Uh, yeah, um, again, there I would uh, go with um, facilitation techniques. If you feel, I mean, just having a team discuss and discuss may not be the only or the best approach. Uh, again, you can work with different facilitation techniques for example, um, with um, silent brainstorming, which only takes 10 minutes, you get everybody to sit around a table and have, they have pen and paper. Um, and you invite them to brainstorm on a particular issue um, silently. Don't talk. You only interrupt others' good thoughts. 10 minutes in silence, not more. All ideas you write down on a separate piece of paper, which you then put back into the middle. 
So if your neighbor gets runs out of ideas, they can, he can look at your ideas and continue maybe with a new chain of ideas. After those 10 minutes, you stop it, you invite everyone to cluster the ideas, and, and, and that already gives you a very rich contribution to what's in people's heads. So that's one, one way of um, keeping the analysis going, keeping it fluent. Yeah. Interesting tool. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Works very well. One more. Yeah. Let me... Okay. Yeah. What, one more. Or do you want to continue? There's one question Alison asked. Do, uh, don't you need not just diversity of perspectives, but diversity of personality types? Uh, for example, someone like Henry Fonda's character who won't go along with the group think. Um, yes, the, here is the, the, the challenge. If you have, if the, and that's exactly what team readiness is about. The team can be ready to deal with this diversity. Uh, and then anybody who has a different idea will feel comfortable to say so. If the team is not ready to deal with its diversity, then you need the guts of a Henry Fonda and the personality of a Henry Fonda or of a Greta Thunberg mm -hmm. to go against the, the, the majority line. But the more ready a team is and we will come, I think it's time to move on to the, I need to move on to the second part where we're going to look at obstacles and how to overcome them. So our job as intercultural professionals is, of course, to understand the challenges of a team, of, of diversity in a team. And it's not, it's not just walking on clouds. It's heavy work. It's all exhausting. And we need to help teams to deal with that and to become ready. So I'm going to move on now and um, hope I covered the, the, some of the toughest questions. So here, team readiness is the capacity of a team to use its cultural and cognitive diversity as a resource for creativity and innovation. It's not easy, but it can be developed. The challenges. And I'm going to skip the little exchange I had prepared here because I want to make sure we cover some of the stuff I have more further down. Some of you might have come across this um, groundbreaking meta-analysis by Williams and O'Reilly. They analyzed 80 studies and 40 years of research on diversity in teams. Um, and they found that, yes, if you have diversity in teams, these teams can succeed in terms of task-related output. However, they usually fail in terms of ever wanting to work together again. <clears throat> um, and they usually also fail in terms of satisfying the personal needs of the individual team members. So where it comes to the social and personal sides of teamwork, um, usually diverse teams fail. It doesn't just come because everyone says it's great. Diverse teams still, um, uh, Williams and O'Reilly study, they have more turnover, people just withdraw, they stop saying anything, they just don't show up anymore, they are absent, or they feel excluded from the important communication channels outside their team, which helps them in their career and everything. They suffer more stereotyping, and someone already saw, said that, yes, how to prevent from cultural stereotypes in a diverse team. If you don't do something, there will be more stereotyping. Less satisfaction, and everyone gets lower performance ratings. So this is, this is the less bright side of diversity in teams. And everyone who just thinks and says, oh, it's great, tell them that they need you to get it right. One of the core, um, um, it's not just an obstacle, it's a nightmare. It's a disaster if you have this in your team. It's called a fault line. Um, if your team falls apart into subgroups, and I'm sure several of you have already um, uh, experience that, um, that you're in a team and you have, for example, um, let's say the Germans and the Dutch fall apart or the guys and the women fall into two groups or you have the engineers and the psychologists fall apart or the younger and the older. Whenever you have a team which has a, which a team can fall apart into subgroups, 
if that happens, then you're in big trouble. It can fall apart because people, you know, the diversity just happens to be, on, you know, you have three engineers all of the same age, all from New York. And in the same team, you have three Italian women all from a marketing background and who are 20 years older than the guys. So you have age, you have specialism, you have nationality, you have gender, all converging together. Um, if, you, if that happens in a team, then this team is very likely to fall apart anyhow. And then this team will probably not benefit from its diversity. It will suffer from its diversity. So this is something you as an intercultural professional will need to get a feel for um, and explore in the intake. How is, is this team, has this fallen apart? Because if it falls apart, you have one-sided loyalties, you have the us versus them bias, you get mistakes and everyone blames the mistakes on the others, etc. We're gonna look at some ways for how you can overcome these, this big thing, the fault line thing. Uh, keys to success, we're gonna go positive now again. Here with team readiness, we focus on three keys to success. The one is, um, and this is a big one, and we all will love, love it, the diversity beliefs of the team members. Uh, and again, this is all based on research, not our research, academ other academic research, which clearly shows that if you have a team and everyone in the team is convinced that it is exactly their differences that are essential for achieving the goals, essential for the success of the teams, if that's the case, then this team can succeed. Diversity beliefs. And we're going to see how that correlates with competencies. Then, someone already said, isn't it just enough to have the different perspectives? Um, yes, you need the different perspectives. That's where your, your benefit comes in. The challenge is to also signal those different perspectives. Um, and research, again, has shown that a team, they can start discussing and arguing and they want to be successful quickly. And they just don't pick up the soft signals of someone disagreeing. For example, by saying, but what if? Uh, I'm not sure, well, well, maybe all these delays, all these sounds of doubt, um, they all indicate a different perspective. We've tested this with several teams where whenever the, someone gave such a signal, we stopped and said, what it, was it you wanted to say? And every time we stopped, someone had a different perspective. So picking up the signals of different perspectives is key. It's the second key success factor. Otherwise, you have the different perspectives, but you don't get them. And the fault lines, which I just mentioned, avoiding the fault lines, keeping the team together. These are the three success factors that we focus on in team readiness. And we have checked and analyzed how these three factors work with the competence um, system that we've developed, um, the intercultural readiness uh, system. And it's uh, almost quarter to seven, so I um, need to uh, move on. Um, several of you may have already heard of the intercultural readiness approach. Um, we look at four intercultural competencies, which are shown here on the slides. Um, the first two are the usual suspects, intercultural sensitivity, intercultural communication. Then we have building commitment, which we assess, which is the ability to bring people together around shared goals and managing uncertainty. How does uncertainty in cultural, intercultural situations affect you? Can you deal with it? Do you like it or do you avoid it? These four competencies. Now, here we have um, facets, more words, I'm, going to th I'm throwing now at you, apologies for that. Uh, for each competence, we say they are skills, sub-skills of each competence. Um, and they play a major role in a minute. That's what I'm showing you this slide as well. So these are the four competencies that we work with. We can measure them and we have done research with them that relates to team readiness. Um, and 
we've got we've tested how these competencies correlate with the success success factors and that's what we're going to look at now and you'll see these eight these facets on different slides again no worries if that went too fast for you so here we had the three key factors diversity believes our difference are essential for our performance then are your team members really able to listen to the signals when someone wants to say something different? Do your people in the team really pick up the signals? And can you keep the team from falling apart? Three success factors. We have correlated these three factors uh, with our competencies and we found a very interesting picture. So we found that, um, and I'm gonna scroll down here, we found that um, the positive diversity beliefs. So people, if you have people who are convinced that diversity is essential in the team, these people usually score top, have top scores on building commitment and managing uncertainty. They have top scores on these four facets. So if we have someone who fills in the IRC and they have top scores on building commitment and managing uncertainty, we can be pretty sure that this person in a team if this person functions in a team, will embrace differences in the team. That's one of the things we found. Another thing we found is that people who score high on sensitivity and communication, they are the ones who have developed these goods. They can pick up the signals. They are sensitive to when someone wants to say something. They are sensitive to different feelings and needs of others in the team. So those team members who score high on these two competencies, they are the ones who we can encourage to pay, to pay attention to the signals and to open the mouth and say it and help others to pick up the signals as well. So these are the people in the team who pick up the signals. Third, the fault lines, the big disaster in the team, if the team falls apart into subgroups, you're in big trouble. However, if you have people who scored they have top scores on managing uncertainty and they are in your team, these people will find it more easy to deal with stormy weather, to deal with tensions in the team. You can engage these people scoring high on managing uncertainty to help you keep the team together because they don't suffer so much from the dynamics in the team. So we have these three success factors, um, diversity beliefs, picking up the signals of different perspectives and keeping the team together. And we've correlated them with the competencies. Um, I'm gonna check the clock now, it's a quarter to seven. Let's have a quick check, Steve, for questions and comments before I go to the last part of the webinar. Okay, there is one question that's come in from Nancy. Many people say that diversity is necessary. They say that diversity is necessary. How can we be sure they really believe it? Hmm. Good, good question. Um, well, um, of course, I would say take the IRC. Um, um, I will see that in their scores. Um, if they score low, score low on managing uncertainty and building commitment, um, then I will challenge them on that perspective. Um, if, uh, if you don't have the time for that um, on the spot, um, you ask them for one or two good examples convincing examples, and then you will probably find them either come up with good examples or struggling um, and make it real, not just platitudes. Have them come up with really good examples. And also ask them the questions that you asked earlier. Okay, so how can you keep, this is tough, you know, what if your people get tired of lengthy discussions? What do you do then? So challenge them on that. Everyone can, can now sing that song, but it's, it's hard work and people need to be crystal clear of what they're getting their, themselves into. They need us. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Nancy, I hope I answered or helped you address the issue. Okay, 
Glad to hear that, yes. Any other comments or questions that we would want to look at, Steve? Okay, shall we move on? Okay, here's again the, the yeah. summary, and um, this is just a summary um, of the logic. So when we have a team, we ask them to complete the IRC, each of them individually, that's important. They don't have to show each other the results. The results are confidential. But we can already, from the individual reports, we can already predict how easy it will be for this team to get their diversity act together. So we can ask, does this team have enough people with, these, with, the, um, with the skills to pick up signals? Um, do we have enough people in the team who really believe in diversity? Do we have enough firefighters who don't mind the little fight, who don't mind the chaos, who can survive the fault lines and bring the, keep the team together despite the tensions? So from the individual reports, we can see that. Here is the process that we would use. Um, um, there is a preparation part where people, where we conduct a proper team intake to get a feel for the task of the team and for the context. We analyze how is the composition of the team? Is, it, is everybody different? Is everybody the same, like in the, looking the same or, you know, like in, in 12 Angry Men? Um, uh, or do we, does it run the risk of falling apart into subgroups? Um, then um, do they need to be creative or do they just need to run business as usual? Um, then um, people fill in the IRC, the questionnaire to assess these four competencies. And based on all of that together, we design a half day or one or two day training session, ideally stretched out if we have more than a day. Um, we, we design a training session where we help people understand the challenge, the potential, but also the obstacles of the diversity in their team. And we do this with exercises and, and um, reflection time, exploration time, etc. cetera. Um, and we, um, then we introduce working with the competencies. And the third step here is really important they will receive their profiles individually, confidential profiles, and they, with the facets, the eight individual facets, they will get as cards, separate cards. So if they see from their profiles that, for example, they really score high on cultural awareness and attention to signals, these are the two cards that they can really take, then they can take these cards because these are really their top skills and they, put these cards into the team middle, into the center of the table. And everyone looks at the individual confidential profile and they take the cards and they say, on these, these cards, they show my skills and these skills I dedicate to the team. So all the cards are in the table in the middle and the whole team sees the skill set, the team skill set. No one had to share the confidential report. That's important. And so, then we can see, okay, if you really want to pick up the signals, how many people in your team, how many skills, how, do you, how many people have these skills? So you have the challenge, pick up signals in your team. And maybe you only have in a team of 10, you only have four cards showing these skills. Or you have no one who scores higher managing uncertainty. Then you can say, hey guys, if you're going to get tough, if you have conflict and tension in your team, there is no one who can help you survive the tension. How are you going to deal with this? So we create a team chart, I, I did, um, a team chart where we see how many of them have the right skills and whether we have gaps in the team which will make them suffer at predictable moments in the way along. And then the fourth step, I like also a lot because then we say, okay, guys, I'm almost good with picking up signals. Um, I'm almost good with these skills. Um, I'd like to develop this further because my team needs this skill. Who can help me? Who of you can be my buddy and help me develop my skill? So you invite the team 
to help each other, to help each other deal with the diversity. Um, and so you're giving them a cooperative task that will, at the same time, whilst they are working on the right skills, they are also creating a cooperative mindset that already helps them take the next big step towards becoming a strong team. So that's, in a nutshell, team readiness. And let me take a look at the clock. It's 18.54 on my smartphone. To sum up, yes, culturally diverse teams can be more creative and innovative than less diverse teams, but it's tough. There's, um, you can have a lot of benefits, but it's really hard work. The team can fall apart. You can have exhaustive discussions. You can have people excluded. You can have more conflicts and you need to avoid the downsides in order to get to the plus side of it. Um, and diverse teams, why would they have to do this by themselves? No one was born with these skills. As intercultural professionals, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have the competence analyses to help teams do this and focus on the core job, namely um, do the job. That's the summary of today's webinar. Here's a little promotion of the book we wrote about intercultural readiness. And in chapter number five, which is just one of the six chapters, you find um, all of our teams and lots of other chapters. I hope you have a moment to Google it and, and order it. Um, check out our websites if you want to know more about our work. And uh, enough of commercial time, um, your key takeaways. Let me, if you have issues that you want to bring up, things where I was too fast or not convincing, where your diverse perspective comes in, please let us know and also your key takeaways. We still have time for that. Okay, I'm gonna observe the chat function and Steve, please help me pick up the key things. Sure. Yes, as Ursula requested, go ahead and put any takeaways in the chat window. At the same time, I am going to launch the feedback poll, if you could respond to a couple of questions about the webinar. And we'll do three things in parallel here. I will review a couple of the questions that came in towards the end. So here. Oh, great. Glad you liked it, yes. Yeah, how long are the interventions? It depends. They can be half a day, they can be one and a half day. Um, it depends on how much the team needs. Yes. But you can achieve a lot in half a day. There were a couple of questions that came mm -hmm. in a few minutes ago that good questions, and I think either one of them could yeah. have a whole webinar in itself. You yes. Know, how do you select the right team members? Ah, yeah. A nice, a nice challenge. And another question is how open are companies to working with interculturalists to help yes. challenges? Yeah, I think the first one was the selection part. If you can select, if you have the luxury, um, then um, I would definitely. Uh, look for getting a diverse team together um, and have it um, really mixed. So uh, not, just, not just go for gender diversity. If you only go for gender diversity, 50-50, doesn't work, doesn't help. Meta-analysis show you don't have enough uh, le le leverage for that. Uh, so you wanna have some men and some women and you wanna have some Italians and then you wanna have the Polish mathematician and you know, all sorts of differences uh, being put together carefully um, and have um, real specialists on certain things like the real biologist, the real IT person, so, um, and some lay people. Um, so that's from the knowledge part. Um, and then of course you can use, um, you can assess them on their intercultural competencies, especially the team leader. Along the lines that I sketched, and say, okay, if we have, if we can choose, we need some people who score high here, some people who score high here. Yeah, so if you can select, there are a couple of guidelines you can follow. Otherwise, you need to develop and encourage the team to develop these competencies. What I see now is that um, 
I think that if we write a new story about us as intercultural professionals, the time is right to do so. Um, for a long time, there, were cult there, there was the, the storyline was cultural differences are an obstacle. If only we all were alike, we were so much better. So yes, we're going to hire this intercultural professional because we have to. Uh, um, and but now the story is oh, cultural diversity is an opportunity. Oh, you're an intercultural professional. Oh, oh, you can help us overcome the difficulty. That's now the storyline. And then people, if you tell them that they are just that far away from really benefiting from diversity and turning it into something that people love and enjoy and that gives them energy instead of costing them energy and the, you can help their teams save a lot of energy so that they can focus on the team success, then they will be very positive. And you as an intercultural professional, you focus on the facilitation, on, the, on getting the group work together with each other. Um, you don't need to be a specialist on Italian or Bulgarian culture, but you need to have tools for getting a culturally diverse team and use those tools for a team that maybe just differs in terms of gender or expertise or, or age or professionalism. Use your intercultural facilitation skills for the greater diversity, the cognitive diversity in the team. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Ursula. I see we're at the top of the hour. Mm. I very much appreciated what I heard from you today, and I'm looking forward to applying some of it when I meet with my teams next week. Okay. And it really looks like the IRC is, is so comprehensive, looking at ways that we can really leverage diversity. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with yes. us. Um, You're welcome to pleasure. come back anytime. <laughs> yeah, thank you, yes, yes. And if you have any questions about how to assess the competencies, please do get in touch. Um, oh, you great. can, you know, you can become certified to work with it, yes, yes. Ah, okay, okay, good to know. So thank you also for, to all of you for attending. Appreciate what you've gotten out of this. The recording of the webinar will be put up on the YouTube channel within the next couple of days. And please join us for the next webinar. We're taking a break in August. So the next webinar is on the 17th of September with Mihaela Barbaru, who will be presenting a webinar with the topic communication and emotion in intercultural mediation. So with that, I wish you all a good rest of the day, a nice summer or winter, wherever you might be, and see you all in September. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you, Steve and Christine, again. Thanks very much, and thanks, everybody. It was pleased to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great interactive session. Thank you. Pleasure to do so. Okay. Okay. Take care, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Take care. Bye. 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 -bye.